All right, so we'll go ahead and start. Again, we're picking up sort of in the middle. I wanted to get this all done in one, one session. Uh, number nine is where, we're, where we'll be. So it's kind of continuing the furniture section. So all the stuff that we put up there, that we leave up there. Why? What's it called? What does it do? Um, what maybe do we not want up there? Things like that. Um, so, uh, and I didn't do a ton of review this, this week, so you'll have to pause. I'll have to, you'll have to bear with me as I try to figure out where we are. Um, hey, Susan. Um, so the, the accessories or appointments in sacred space, and we talked about like, the, the idea of the space being special or set apart, uh, they can vary in number and elaborateness. Uh, that is, some congregations will have less, some congregations will have more. Um, so not everything that is necessarily discussed is something we even will, will have. Um, besides the pyramids, which we, I think, will talk about. I don't think we've talked about those yet. No, no, we did. That was what we just did. And did we? Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. And the sacred vessel, so that's the communion ware, uh, the stuff that holds the bread and the wine for distribution. There should be, at minimum, suggested, uh, a cross or crucifix, the service book, uh, a stand for this book, and candles. Uh, and the service book is that big book that sits up there. It's, uh, we call it the altar book, usually. Uh, it's got a lot of various resources for the pastor to use during the service. Um, the most important is the cross or the crucifix. Uh, in the early church, a cross, usually a processional cross, that'd be one that you could carry on a stick, uh, was placed in a bracket or socket next to the altar. During the Middle Ages, the custom arose of placing the cross on the altar or the gradine. That's that, the gradine is that part that's behind the altar, which normally would be attached to the wall, uh, but in ours is actually sort of attached to the wall, to the altar itself. Um, uh, but this practice did not become widespread, that is, putting a cross on the altar until after the Reformation. So if you can imagine, in the early church, you wouldn't have had a cross on the wall or a cross on the altar. You would have just had a processional cross standing beside the altar. And it's only after the Reformation that you see this uh, development of more, more crosses. Hello, family. Welcome. Uh, the crucifix, which is a cross with a body on it, uh, often not called a body, where is it up here? Often called a corpus, which is the Latin word for body. Um, the crucifix, a cross with a body on it of the suffering of Christ, began to appear in the late medieval period. So you're looking, late medieval would be any time after 900, 1,000, um, during a period of increasing emphasis on the passion of the Christ. So there was, uh, in the Middle Ages, an, an emphasis on Jesus' death for us. And this is even under, under Rome. Um, from a Lutheran perspective, however, the crucifix, the use of the crucifix has much to commend it. Um, now does he have a, yeah, down here on the bottom, in the footnote, uh, Paul Lang, who is a, a Lutheran liturgist, somebody who studies these kinds of things as his, it's like his shtick, is what he likes to, to know a lot about historically, uh, writes in one book, uh, the crucifix emphasizes the incarnation of Christ and his atoning sacrifice. A plain or empty cross lacks this emphasis. Some say that the plain cross stands for the resurrection. Uh, be that as it may, it can also represent a devaluation of the incarnation and a spiritualizing of Christ. And I think that's fairly important in that, you know, whether or not we ever get one, uh, the reason we don't have one is not because it's a Catholic thing or it's not Lutheran to have one. Lutherans moved to a point uh, in our history where you always had one, and we moved away from that. And part of the movement that brought us away from that was a devaluation of the incarnation and the spiritualizing movement of Protestantism, uh, uh, treating uh, physical things as less valuable than spiritual things, which is a throwback to even Plato. That's kind of a deep thought, but just think of, um, Protestantism can't see the bread and wine, the Lord's Supper, as being a thing that does something. Why? Because it's material, and only the Spirit does good things. 
And the crucifix forces us to see the material reality of Jesus. The cross lets us kind of forget about that part. It just kind of went away. Um, also, I was listening on uh, issues, etc. I don't remember who was talking uh, recently or what the topic was, but uh, it was about this idea that the plain cross signifies the resurrection, and he kind of laughed at it. I'd never heard this argument before, but he kind of laughed. He said, uh, the cross never represents the resurrection. The cross always represents the crucifixion, one way or the other. It's where he died. He died on the cross. Uh, so the question is, why don't you want to see the body? Like, what, what is the value of not having that body there if it's there to remind you of his death? I thought that was an interesting take on it. I've never heard that before. Um, so there is much to recommend it to us um, as a practice, uh, although, again, not necessary and certainly not um, always there in the history of the church. Um, in, fact, in the same way, I recognize that even the cross was not always there uh, in the history of the church as a symbol. That's something that was put up physically. Um, despite its late invention, the altar cross is extremely common in Lutheran church buildings. It sits at the back of the mensa or on the gradine. Uh, with a freestanding altar, the cross should be placed on the gradine attached to the rear of it. So, uh, if we have... A sanctuary like this with the altar on the wall, and you have your gradient and rear dose, the cross would be put on that part. If the freestanding altar would be like this, where the pastor would stand here and face the congregation, you would still have this on the wall and the cross would go there. He's going to say in a moment, though, that once you put a cross on the wall, you don't want anything to distract from that, um, and so you don't necessarily have one there at, at all. Um, so he'll get to that uh, in a moment. Um, there are, however, other methods for placing a cross or crucifix in the chancel. One way is to affix it to the liturgical east wall, which is what we have upstairs. A big cross attached to the wall. Uh, let's go to the next page. Another method is to suspend the cross from the ceiling. You ever seen one of these? This is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah where it's like hanging there and, and everything. Uh, and they did that at the higher things. They did that. Uh, it was really neat. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm just thinking if I've been there. I don't think I've been there. Um, yes, is that the the main, the big one with the school? Yeah. Yeah, I have been there. I didn't notice it though. Um, I, I didn't work. It wasn't for worship. It was for a meeting. So, no, you, you're probably right. Um, a third way. A third way is to attach a cross to the front of the altar, or to have it carved in the wood of the altar. Um, which oftentimes you'll see both of those uh, done. I've never seen one, a church or a congregation that just had it on the altar. Um, so that, I've not seen that. But finally, the ancient practice of placing a processional cross into a socket next to the altar could be restored. Um, and, and often is, although it tends to be that if you have a processional cross now, uh, which I'd love to have a processional crucifix, but... If you have one, you don't place it by the altar to distract from the whatever you have there. You would put it by the pulpit or by the, by the font, depending on where those places are, um, to keep it kind of spaced. Um, one of the arguments I've had very, uh, I thought was a good argument, it's not, and it's not final, but you, know, you put it by the, by the pulpit in such a way that it's right behind the pastor's head, so even if he's not making any sense and talking about nothing, you're still going to hear about Christ crucified, because <laughs> he can't avoid it. I thought, that's, that's clever. Um, so, uh, something that should be avoided in placing a cross on the altar in the chancel is the proliferation of crosses in the chancel area. This is kind of a, this is an aesthetic idea. More is not always better, and the multiplication of this emblem lessens the impact and devotional character. Let's see, is he going to talk more about that? Uh, no. So, so And that's, that happens no matter what you put up there, it's going to gradually draw away. You can try to, to frame it in such a way that it pushes you back and that it is possible. Um, but his point here particularly is that by being the same symbol over and over again, um, it, it, it can only pull away from it. Um, I'd never thought about this until I was uh, 
was reading through this, and then I went upstairs and just started looking, and we do have quite a few uh, up there. Um, they're kind of hidden in nooks and crannies, um, but we do have quite a few. And so I was like, oh, okay. Um, the, do you want to ask about that or talk about that? or? Uh, no. All kind of saying, where? Where? Well, we got, we got the one that is meant to go on an altar, that's no longer on an altar that gets put onto the credence table. Okay? Because mm -hmm. um, we, we got, really didn't know what to do with it. Right. Yeah. That's uh, the big cross up there. Do you want it in the middle on the altar? It can't no, be anything, no, no. It, what, well, what I want is only like part of the conversation. What is suggested would be that we, since we put the big cross up, we just take that one away. Well, what would we do with it? Uh, if you want to try to make sure it still gets used, you uh, first step would be you, you take out or you send information to the LCMS reporter and the witness, and you offer it as a free gift to a congregation. So we just put it in the fellowship yeah. room instead of that wooden mm -hmm. cross. Mm -hmm. Unless I, I don't know who would get mad about the losing of the wooden cross, um, but yeah, that would be another option. Um, it is just wooden, right? It's I'm just trying to think of it. I can't. I don't place know. So yeah, that would be another option. Um, Did this used to be down here at the one time? time? I think it used to be down here. So do you like having a processional side? Mm -hmm. So why don't we why don't we do that? Here I couldn't tell you. Because um, I don't know the history of it. Acolyte, acolytes, and then they sit down. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason why they couldn't go to the back and then do that mm -hmm. on Sundays? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, mainly because it's new would be the reason like that I, I won't just do it, right? Um, but it is a uh, it's a cool thing to have and use, especially on um, what do you call that the, the the big days, the high days, feast days. Um, at at Bethany, we processed every week, which was neat. But it actually, I thought, diminished it a little bit. Mm -hmm. But what they did then was they processed every week, but only on high feast days they had what's called a gospel procession, which is then you process from the front to the middle of the congregation for the gospel reading, uh, and then back up. And it just another way of elevating things like more. Yeah. I always think it's something special when you actually do it. Right. Well, and so that would be, I mean, if we were to introduce that, I would hardly just shove it in, it would be the thing we would do on really unique times. Um, I'm hoping, i got to still talk the choir into this, I'm hoping to have the choir process and sing the opening song on Christmas Eve without a processional cross, just walking in and, and opening the service. Um, but I still have to kind of talk them into that. Um, so, uh, but you know, but that's one of those things that, you know, there's always somebody wants to give a memorial and mm -hmm. yeah. well, kind of we have that. we have a member right now. You know, oh my gosh. Pretty, but that would be one of the things that could go on that. List. We have a member right now who will buy one immediately. I've told him no. I've said as soon as I got here he basically said, I want one, I'll buy it and I said, Let's let's wait, let's learn, you know, and then if we all think it's a good idea we can do it. Um which, oh, and I just lost. We did it when Pastor Richard was here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But, which is why he did it a couple of times yeah. on his own for us. The, yeah, which he also, you know, had worked to introduce at, at Gwinner because they had gone even further in a different direction away from liturgical worship. There, it, it's hard to have honest conversations about why we do what we do as LCMS now without understanding a movement called pietism which began in the 1700s, late 1700s, early 1800s, and not only birthed Methodism in one sense, John Wesley, when they talk about him being influenced by Lutheranism, they, they mean pietism, um, but then uh, also kind of became the dominant movement underneath most of American Lutheranism as it was settled. The LCMS initially, began as a reaction against pietism, trying to leave it behind, uh, but are in doing so, uh, it's, there's a lot of history here, I'm sorry. It, it, there was another movement that came out of it called rationalism. Um, pietism rejected authority, 
Uh, it rejected physical things. It, was, it rejected community faith. It was all about the individual uh, and the experience. And so it met in small groups away from church in the evenings, and that was the real church, and you only went to church because you kind of had to by the state law. Uh, it, it acted as if the sacrament was fine, but it really wasn't going to help you in any way in your faith and things like that. The next era ends up with an almost total unbelief all the way across the board that there are no spiritual things. There is only reason and science. Um, so the LCMS begins as uh, and Walter they're reacting against both of these and yet as they do so there are enough American Lutheranism churches that don't like where rationalism's going in terms of this rejection of everything so they start coming to the LCMS in order to be with our stance on scripture and we, we say, sure, come on in, we'll, we'll teach you. But it, 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 we grew so fast that we couldn't, um, what's the right word, naturalize uh, the newcomers fast enough. And so where we, we were founded as a hunger for scripture as confessed in our confessions, the love of scripture ended up overshadowing the love of our confessions. And with that, liturgical worship became stale or um, there was a less emphasis on the things that we do ritually because pietism is anti-outward things and ritual is always outward, right? We want to only emphasize the inward things. So you have in American Lutheran churches a history of just having less of the things that Lutheranism historically had. And in various places you see more and less. Some congregations have fought hard to bring it back. Um, some resist it more. All of this can't really be understood without also the iconoclasm of the Reformed, which was the Calvinists uh, believed that the second commandment entails having no images, especially no statues, but initially no images, which led to a destroying of art and anything that looked like art uh, in their buildings so that a truly Calvinist church is a white-walled room with pews and a pulpit. Yeah, yeah, they yeah have probably. Adornment yeah. Well, but we've, LCMS Lutheranism, 100 years ago, couldn't help but be influenced by this. And so many of our churches have a very subtle iconoclasm to them, um, in that most of, our, most of our artwork that we do have, we intentionally don't look medieval. We don't look gothic. We don't look, you can say the word with me, Catholic. Yeah, um, uh, and instead we've embraced more of an American imagery, um, and it's not that you know that that we can't make good American art either, um, but it's affected kind of a lack of things in the church. Now our windows upstairs, I, I contend they're gorgeous and that they are a a great example of going the other direction, trying to reclaim a Catholic you know, the little C thing, an ancient idea. Um, so, so anyway, as we're having this discussion, and, and Denise asks why, well, there's 300 years of, of philosophical war behind the entire thing. Um, and so it's not that easy as to say why um, and, and where the influences came from and whatnot. Um, I have gotten the impression that North Dakota as a district uh, is just a little more, see, we use these words, these aren't really fair words, a little more low church, but still liturgical, which um, there's not a lot of that left. Usually today, if you, if you travel, you're either going to see a congregation that is intentionally capturing the liturgy and becoming what we would call maybe high church, or they got a band and they're trying to entertain. And those are really your two directions. And so in many ways, the district is sort of a throwback. Um, the challenge with a truly low church experience is that it, it can actually be very stale and boring. It can come off as very, very dry. Um, and so how do you, I mean, in all of this, what do I want more than anything is not any particular thing. What I want us is discover why we do what we do and, and then have that teach us as we do it. Right? Uh, so that when, I was talking to the conference today, when I'm forgiven your sins in the absolution, you know what's going on. I'm not just up there reading something off a piece of paper cuts. Um, and uh, uh, that listening and hearing and growth is, is really the key behind all of it. Now, why is 
a processional crucifix or cross um, valuable for us? Well, why are we here, right? Because Christ is going to enter our midst to save us by his word and sacrament. And so we have this image of his salvation entering our midst as we sing our opening. Yeah? And the, the idea for that gospel procession, the words of the gospel being read from the middle of the congregation, is that Christ comes down from the front into the middle of his people. And he stands in the midst of the crowd and he teaches, right? Just like he did. Yeah? So it's all attempts to, to give you that, uh, again, experience of what we're actually doing. Uh, it's not for its own sake. None of it's for its own sake. Uh, and, and that's the danger, is the moment that it is for its own sake, it's not doing us any good. Then we really do have an idol, basically. Um, so. so I'd love to get there someday, yeah. um, but I don't want to shock anybody either. And, uh, um, and you do have a member who, who this is something that that person wants very much. Um, but I think that came as a result of learning. And I think that, that learning is more important than anything. I, um, I'll give you a little philosophy of change. There's two, two ways a pastor can change things. He can just change them. And then when he leaves, 10 years, 15 years, 30 years, 5 years, doesn't matter. When he leaves, guess what happens? He gets changed back, right? <laughs> or um, uh, he can convince you that it's actually a really good idea, and then you change it. And then, then it's yours. So my hope is, is to convince you of a few things that are worth doing and then let you do them. Um, as we go. We good? After 30 years. After 30 years, we can't remember. Can't remember. Can't remember. So yeah. Yeah. Or you just outlive them, right? Um, yeah. It's, yeah. I, I learned that lesson the hard way. I'll just say that. Um, several books are necessary for conducting the service. The altar book, uh, or the missal, from the Latin term for mass, uh, the agenda, the lectionary, and hymnals. This is less important uh, for, for us to know. I mean, the most, most interesting thing is that we actually, as Lutherans, still believe in the Mass. Like, our confessions call the Lord's Supper the Mass. There's nothing wrong with the term. Uh, we don't believe in the sacrifice of the Mass. That's what the Romans do. We just have the Lord's Supper, which you can call the Mass. So this Missal book, the altar book, is there as a tool for the pastor to, to handle the Mass. And the most important thing that you have is that it stays open, and then there's a thing that holds it. The, uh, at Bethany, the, the, the stand that held it would always uh, fall backwards and land upside down, and you'd have to sit there and like precariously keep it from falling. That's, that's what you don't want, right? You want, you want to be able to easily manage what's going on. The agenda doesn't need to be up there. I don't know why. I mean, he, he says so, but I have an agenda. I pull it out for, uh, for weddings, for funerals. It's the, it's the larger book that I'll carry during those things. Uh, most pastors have their own. Lectionary is the book that's on the lectern, not the pulpit, that um, I've started using to read from, uh, just because it's got larger print than the back of the bulletin does. Mm -hmm. um, there is a three-year version and a one-year version. We use the three-year here. Um, at some point, I may want to use the one-year for a year, because uh, it's just a, it's another uh, attack at it. Uh, and then hymnals. I have found a few times I've gotten up there without my hymnal and realized there's no hymnal for the pastor. I don't know. Yeah, like you don't have a... A place for one. Um, many chairs, like our chairs, would have had like a little shelf underneath. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I use my own anyway. Um, that someone gave me a long time ago with my name on it, so it doesn't matter. But like, if we had a guest preacher somehow out of nowhere and we didn't warn him, I keep get up there and, oops, yeah. Um, so, just something else that that happens. Uh, the altar book's placed on the missile stand. I don't. I, I we have one. It works from what I can tell. Um, the placement of the missile stand and book on the altar will vary. For the chief service, the sacramental vessels should be in the center of the altar. This is something that I have just tried to ignore. Um, so this is our altar. In most LCMS churches, when you have the Lord's Supper covered with uh, the veil or whatever, you'll have it um, placed dead center, as opposed to we tend to have it over here. Um, unless, remember we talked about that table, the credence table can actually be used to, to hold the elements before and after the service as well. That's what it's there for technically. Um, so those are the, kind of the two options there. Um, why? Why is it center? Um, can you answer that one? Can you figure it out? It's 
It's the most important thing. It's the most important thing. It's Christ. That's right. It's why we're here. Yeah. And so putting it to the side is just sort of a strange thing. Right? Um, so then to deal with the offering plates, we have to have a second. Well, we've been putting the offering plates on the credence table. Yeah, which, that's what I'm saying. If we um, use that. Which I kind of like myself. I, I've been very thankful not to have the offering plates on the altar until Advent. <laughs> now they're all on the altar suddenly. Um, because the altar, and this is like a personal thing, but it's, I think it has good reason. Um, the altar is not there for sacrifices. And the offerings is sacrifice. We are giving sacrificially to the church. Yeah? And so I don't want to put it on the altar because it's not there for me to sacrifice anything. It's there for God to give me what has already been sacrificed. And so I, I really don't want the, the offering plates on the altar if I can help it, because it, it just strikes me. Um, and so I, I don't mind having it on the credence, and if you've noticed, since we've got the credence table gone for Advent, I'm just walking into the office and sitting in the office after church, or after, the, after it's given. Um, and that's, that's, you know, it's me, it's based on what we believe, but it, it struck me, I, I read a, one of my favorite teachers or, or writers, his name is Herman Sasa, I didn't have him personally as a teacher, but... Uh, he has influenced me greatly, um, and uh, he was he wrote underneath the Nazi regime as a confessor. He, he stood the he stood strong in a church that was rejecting Christianity altogether, and um, he visited the U.S. in the in the early '60s, I believe, and and he wrote an, an essay about it. And the thing that struck him more than anything else about Americans is that we put filthy lucre on the altar, and that was his way of looking at it. Only, he said only Americans could, could put something so profane as money in a sacred place. Uh, um, and if you, you remember when you were in Europe, where were the offerings taken? Do you remember? We didn't go to church. No? You never looked in churches? We looked in churches. Did you see offerings? They don't use plates. There's a, there's a lockbox at the back. Oh, okay. Yeah? yeah. And you walk out and you put your okay. thing in the yeah. back. And, and if you go to church service, it's, at, it's the last thing in the service. On your way out, you don't shake hands. That's an American thing, too. But they, on your way out, you put your offering in the lockbox, right? So for them, I mean, offerings are good. They're necessary. But it was it's kind of actually more widow's mighty. Don't let anyone see you do it. Yeah? Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and then here we are, you know, as if God needs it. Um, and uh, so anyway... Um, I like keeping it on the credence. I think that's a nice, happy medium off to the side. Um, but the whole point of this here is that the centerpiece, uh, I mean, can you get this too as Americans? In, in a country that's rejected the real presence of Christ in most of our churches, and then having this be the thing that we put next to it or put up there with it, and the, the distinction between mammon, right? Mammon and, and our God. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's a profound idea, really. And at the end of the day, does it matter where you put the money? No. You know, right? it, it actually doesn't matter. What matters is what we believe. <laughs> yeah? mm -hmm. And so, so striving to, to say what we believe with what we do uh, is just an overall goal. Um, so accordingly, the missile stand should be placed to the left or right of the corporal, that's the, the bread, um, at an angle so that it can be read easily by the presiding minister. Um, which is basically where I have it sitting at this point all the time. Um, however, for, for the offices um, that are not the Lord's Supper, you can put the missile stand back into, into the middle. Um, so like our, our two non-communion services a month, if you wanted the extra work as altar guild, you could make sure you move it to the middle, and, then, and that would be fine and appropriate. Um, it doesn't matter, and it's one extra step, so I'm not going to ask you to do it, but uh, I just... I'm fine leaving it where it is. Um, so, yeah, Susan, sure. When you go up there to distribute the communion, you mm -hmm. move it to the middle. Mm -hmm. Why are you doing that? I don't know that anybody would have a problem with us just putting it in the putting middle it there. to begin with. It's just that that's the way we were taught to do it. Right. You know, I mean, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Yes. I mean, so. <laughs> well, and, and that would be fine. And there's room there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reemphasize, though. So, like, there's two things I want right now more than anything. And one is that we don't rush to change anything and that we don't rush and then we don't refuse to change anything. Do you yeah? think anybody that's sitting out there that doesn't prepare the communion would even notice Probably that not. Um, but it is things that are visible have a bigger impact than things that are not. 
And so I, I would very much want us to, to pick our spots. And if we're going to do something, do something all at once. So if we're going to put it in the middle uh, on purpose, but we also want to get a set of uh, colored veils to go with it with some new pyramids, like do it all at the same time. And that way you don't have constant change. But right? by the same token, when you stand in the center of the altar, then it's not visible mm -hmm. to the congregation. No. no. Whereby, you know, by leaving it where it is, we're all right. aware of what's... Well, <laughs> Gloria, that would be why I'm asking for a freestanding altar. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. Oh, um, we yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, see, and that's, I mean, that's something that really, I think, is, is valuable. By the time that I'm standing right there, um, there's not much left. I mean, it's, if you notice, I do all the liturgy from, yeah. from further away and then move my way up just in time to turn. I mean, the prayers would be the only time that I'm really just covering it. Um, so the idea is, you know, you walk, you walk in Sunday morning and you, the whole church is pushing you to the cross and the, the elements, right? And that that's what you see. Um, and then everything else is serving that in some way. Um, does so. that portion, of that thing on the back of the altar, does that come off? I don't think so. Is that just setting there? No. Because Pastor one Tassler pulled the altar away from right. the wall at one time. It you guys had said that. I, and I don't know, it may be attached, it may not be. Um, it, it is not a, uh, it is not the same piece, I know that. Okay. And I don't think it's just setting on it, I think it's another piece behind it. I'm trying to think how he um, did that, if that was still there. Right. So, like, like long term, if that's something we want to, like, the hope is, keep an eye on the time, that we get through this book, and then we can start saying, so, what do we think? Like, what, what do we actually, out of the whole book, want to maybe think about doing? Um, and then at that point, if that's something you're willing to discuss with me, then we go find out, you know, and, and we, we figure out what the steps would be. Um, I mean, did I say this before? I said this to the Sanctuary Discovery Group. One of the things that I'm telling them that we should consider uh, is that we um, take out the, the railings here and take out one set of pews in the front and put railings like this around those pillars so that we can sit 25 people, serve 25 people at once, which will enable us to move through communion a little faster. And if you do that, you have the raised place you can move the altar up to the edge of the steps, and then not only is it freestanding, but I'm not so far away from you. I'm, I'm right up, right up by you again. Um, so, I, and I don't know how much of that's possible, but in the discovery thing, we're just we're dreaming, right? And so, um, that that's one of my thoughts about it. I really, of course, now that she just died, um, but every time I watch Doris come up to communion, I just am cringing because I'm watching her struggle to get up those stairs. Um, and I want to get onto the ground level for the for the people who, who struggle with that. Yeah, Doris Loeb died this week. Um, sorry to that was kind of a bombshell there. Yeah, sorry. Oh. <laughs> it was it was last night. I'm sorry. I was um, hoping it was Doris Loeb and not Doris. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because um, either one. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, well, and it it can be anyone at any time, right? So, um. If you have a freestanding altar, the missile stand is placed in the center for an office that's just for prayer, and at that point, the pastor would stand facing the, the wall rather than you because in the service of prayer, he is acting as a, a collector of the prayers right, on your behalf. And that, that's the value of the freestanding is you can go both directions with it, sacrificial and sacramental. So that's, that's what that last paragraph says. Uh, the agenda, not so necessary to, to worry about. Uh, the lectionary, scripture readings, uh, it has been, become common in some places to read the appointed scripture readings from a sheet of paper. Uh, While well, the important thing is that the word of God is being read, the book from which it is read should be both large and splendid in order to reflect the significance of the word of God in Lutheran theology. The principle is especially important to observe if carrying the book in an entrance or gospel procession. Um, so we've got... Um, 
we've got uh, the lectionaries, and they are, they're nice books. Um, you can even buy, I mean, if you want to go crazy, you can buy these covers that are made, at, made to go on the outside of them that are metal with latches and they're gold and have also, they're pretty. Um, and it wouldn't be my first place to spend money, but uh, if we run out of things to do. Um, but I mean, I try to show when I move the lectionary from the, from the lectern to the pulpit for the gospel reading, I try not to just kind of put it under my arm and walk. I mean, I, I hold it in front of me um, to try to show that it's, a, it's an important book um, and so forth. And like you asked about uh, acolytes, there's all sorts of stuff you can do with acolytes, um, including having, so you have the, the, the cross coming in, and then you have the, the lectionary right behind the cross and then the pastor. Um, because those are the things that are really the important things. So, um, so that's an option. Um, there's a, You guys did evening prayer last year for Lent, I think. Did Pastor Richard have you do an evening prayer service in the hymnal? And it, it has a place at the front of that service for bringing the Christ candle in lit. Uh, and it's really, really, I, I love that service. But. Yeah, he wasn't here during Lent. No. But I think you still used his service yeah. in the bulletin, which I think was evening prayer. And then I was here for one of those. Yeah. One of those. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't remember doing the liturgy. I think I, someone else did it. I just preached. Um, the final book is, of course, the hymnal. hymnal. Uh, the liturgy is printed to assist the congregation. Uh, the other part of the hymnal contains the hymns of the church. Uh, hymnals are helpful. <laughs> in the chancel for the pastor. Ah, candles. The use of candles in the church, like that of crosses, has a long and varied history. Uh, in the early church, oil lamps were most likely used, right? Like these little cups, basically, that would have had a hole at the end of it, because um, they didn't have candles. There was no such thing. Uh, and so they had these oil lamps probably just to light the room. Uh, uh, candles or lamps were not set directly on the altar at first. The practice of placing candlesticks directly on the altar appears to have arisen in the 12th century. Uh, one of the primary uses of lights until the invention of the light bulb was practical uh, so that people could see in the dark. Uh, but the symbolic use of lights, the symbolism, uh, symbolism that has roots in the Old Testament is also important. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. The most common symbolic and ceremonial light in the church building is the candle. Care should be exercised in purchasing candles. Uh, it talks about beeswax, if you get real ones, burn longer and cleaner. Candle followers, which are the little pieces that go on the top of the candle, help them burn straight, as opposed to, we just had a candle spill at, at home the other night, so it didn't burn straight. Um, uh, <clears throat> If followers are used, however, they should be made from the same material as the candle holder, so matching your metals, which you know, should be common sense, I think. Uh, other types of lights have been promoted by ecclesiastical supply companies, such as electric candles and tubes made to look like candles. Um, the reason given to not use these devices is that they are artificial. Uh, a different device that may have some merit is the oil-burning candle. The contention that oil burning candles are devised to look like wax candles and not oil lamps may be a valid reason against using them, but the ancient practice of burning oil offers a good balance. So the idea, the, the, the principle behind that, which is not a bad principle, um, is that in a place where we're gathering to believe the absolute truth together, things should be what they look like. Like the, things shouldn't be pretend. We shouldn't be, we don't want hypocritical art, like literally. Um, uh, and that is an argument which has been used to say that even oil-based candles are, are fake. Now you can get really rigid and legalistic about that and, and refuse to use them. Um, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sold on, on the final application of that, but I, I think it's a good principle to reckon with, um, that striving for authenticity is not a bad idea, right? Um, and uh, is, does that make sense, what I said? Uh, if you go to Issues Etc. and listen yesterday, you can hear me uh, talking about plastic Christmas trees and laughing about ours uh, and how we have one. I um, forgot to say Merry Advent. Merry Advent, yes. yeah. Um, and uh, so there's, you know, there's something about it as Americans, we, we prefer fake stuff and it's really kind of a weird thing. 
Um, but it, there's nothing really wrong with it. But the principle is that, well, if we're going to treat something as sacred, let's make it sacred. And then, so what he's saying about the oil candles is at least, well, they're still trying to be quality candles as opposed to just, you know, a, a, I don't know if you've ever seen a church that has, is their main candles light bulbs, um, but I have. <laughs> and, and that's just a little bit further away from um, candles. Um, why not just have lights, right? Um, and, uh, and so forth. Uh, so, not a hill to die on in my mind, but a good principle to kind of wrestle with what it means. Right? Um, I'll give you another, another uh, example. There was a professor at the seminary named uh, Norman Nagel, and uh, he showed up for an installation that I was at like my last year there. Somehow, I don't know how I was involved in this. I was vesting and he was there. He died just a couple years ago. And he had on a cassock, which is a, it's what our acolytes wear, a black piece. Um, and he was putting it on, and it had buttons sewn on the front, but the whole thing was one piece of Velcro. Yeah? Uh, and, uh, and one of the other pastors said, oh my goodness, is that Velcro? And the pastor meant, like, that's so cool. I'm envious of how easy it is for you to do that. Because if you ever put one of these things on, I mean, it's buttoning all the way down. And, but, but Norman Nagel responded, he said, oh, I'm ashamed in the house of the Lord, things ought not to be other than they are. <laughs> and, he, and he had this way of doing that kind of thing and talking that way. But it, it and it demonstrated, you know, it's not a legalistic thing, but it was like, uh, at, at some point, there's a value in the harder road because it's real. Yeah. Um, there's a value in a real Christmas tree. As much as I don't want to buy one or put one up, they're pretty cool when you have one. Yeah. So that's, that's the principle. That makes sense. Um, all right. Uh, the number and arrangement of candles in the chancel has varied greatly. Most church buildings have at least two on the altar. These are called the Eucharistic lights because they usually burn only for the service of the Eucharist. Uh, the placement depends on the type of altar. With a freestanding altar, these candles are placed on liturgical north and south. With a fixed altar, they may sit on the back of the mensa, uh, which is, I think, what ours do, I believe. Um, if an altar cross or crucifix stands on the altar, the top of the candle should not be higher than the horizontal beams of the cross. Uh, and that's, this is your main cross, right? I mean, you don't have one on the wall. And so the idea is that you would not want the candles to be bigger than your, than your main image. Um, uh, some modern freestanding altars are constructed so the Eucharistic lights are mounted on standards that are positioned on the north and south ends of the altar. So at Bethany, we had a freestanding altar and you had these two really big stands that came up with this big candle in, on either side of the altar. Um, very powerful looking. Um, candelabra uh, that hold three, five, or seven candles are sometimes referred to as office lights. I think we have seven on ours, correct? Yeah. Um, the only number you really don't want is six, uh, and that is uh, actually the, the connected to the Roman Catholic uh, Tridentine requirements. Like they have to have six candles. Um, referred to as the office lights because we would light them no matter what. Uh, so any service that we have, any office that we have, uh, we would light these. Usually placed on standards that sit on the floor, on north and south ends. Um, they can be mounted on floor standards or set against the back wall. So if this is your, your cross going up here, sometimes you'll have that candelabra just attached to the wall here and then hanging this way uh, as well. Um, doesn't really matter per se, but different options that are there. Um, how many candles? Uh, regarding Eucharistic candles, uh, restricting number two is supported in our tradition rather than the Roman norm of six, like I just said. As for the other lights and candles, the following principle is good. The more festive the celebration, the more light. Accordingly, during the penitential season of Lent, the minimum of lights should be employed. On major festivals, the maximum. Um, I think I was talking with Jean and Noreen at one point about um, candles for the, uh, the, the aisle you guys have and, um, and seeing those places. And uh, you know, those are things that some congregations will bring out at Christmas time. Uh, for the, the heightening of, of Christmas Eve and so forth. Um, yeah, okay. So uh, that's it on like basic candles. You're going to talk about the extra candles. The, after that. You know, when, when we had a Christ candle at, at Emmanuel too, the same as you have here, and 
every time we would say to the pastor or whoever, you know, we had vacancies several times, nobody seemed to know when it should be lit. Mm -hmm. So we just kind of made a point of Christmas and right. Easter and baptisms and, you know, but there right. seemed to be no place where we could get he's, I think he's going to talk about it in a moment. Okay. But my understanding, the, the simple rule of thumb would be whenever you got white pyramids, ah, with the okay. exception of Thanksgiving, because Thanksgiving is not actually our a church service. I'm not sure why we have white pyramids on Thanksgiving. I have no idea. But the white pyramid is a sign that this is a big day of Jesus' life. Jesus is in our midst doing something insane, being born, rising from the dead, transfiguring, right? The big moments of Jesus' life, and then with that, baptisms, when he is here in our midst doing something insane. Yeah, same idea. Um, at the same time, uh, again, if in the evening prayer service, which is just an office, a regular prayer office, uh, the Christ candle is lit and processes in, and then all the other candles are lit from it as a service of, whole service is, is around God being our light in the darkness as the sun is going away. So again, it's trying to emphasize Christ being in our midst. You could light that candle uh, every Sunday, and it would still be okay as well. Um, so it just kind of depends. Uh, let's see what he says. He's going to talk about a couple other ones first, though. So crucifix, service book, altar candles, other appointments. Common is the processional cross. Yeah, we already talked about that. Maybe carried in an entrance procession, gospel procession we talked about. Uh, can be carried to the grave site for burial, which is kind of cool. Um, rest in a stand. All right, that's one thing. Generally used with the processional cross are processional torches. Uh, candles mounted on staves. So those two big candles that were the altar candles at Bethany, they actually came out. And you could have two acolytes, one carrying each one, and they would, they would watch behind the crucifix as a processional torch, is what they called that. Didn't do that very often. Um, took too many acolytes. Uh, but they're, they're pretty neat when, they, when you see them. Um, frequently seen in Lutheran churches is the sanctuary light, sometimes called the eternal light. This lamp or candle hanging from the ceiling or mounted on a wall bracket burns continuously. Some traditions, including many Lutheran, understand this to symbolize the continual presence of God, hence the name eternal light. Eternal light. Uh, some insist that white or untinted glass is preferred. Most lamps today, however, are red. Um, that actually, I, I laugh at the eternal light because, like we've said several times, you know, things being too Catholic make us uncomfortable. The origination of the eternal light is one of the most Roman Catholic ideas ever. It was a monk in the Middle Ages who said that because the body of Christ is always present on the altar for us to worship and adore him, there should be a light burning in his presence. Okay, so you know how the Roman Catholics leave the, leave the body and blood of Christ in bread and wine on the altar in something called a tabernacle, a box they built for it, and they come in during the week and they pray to it because they believe that's what it's there for? That's why the eternal light exists, was to, to, to state that fact. So I kind of, I giggle every time someone says too Catholic, and then I see the eternal light, and I just kind of go, that's too Catholic. Because <laughs> it is. Um, but it's, you know, like he says, it just is a, a sign. For us, it's become a sign of the continual presence of God, you know, that he's always here. Um, also becoming more common in Lutheran churches is the use of the thurible or censer, uh, this is for incense. Uh, incense symbolizes the prayers of the faithful rising up before God. It's especially appropriate for vespers or evening prayer. Um, they had it at higher things. It wasn't a hit with our kids. Um, I know uh, some kids like it. I love it. But for some people, it's, uh, it's, it, they really don't like it. Um, allergies, yeah, that's the main thing. If you, and you can overdo it. Um, I love the image of it. Uh, it, it rises, and you, you know, in evening prayer, the psalm that we sing is, uh, uh, let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting of my hands as the evening sacrifice. And so thinking of that image of the smoke rising is that's what our prayers do to God, and that is the historical reason for the incense in the Hebrew tradition, and then adopted by Christianity. And so I love the symbolism of it, but I, you know, for some people it really causes, causes issues. They have hypoallergenic incense. You, know, you can argue till the cows come home, blah, blah, blah. That's fake. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> uh, that's funny. Um, it talks here about when to use it. Uh, many churches today use banners. Banners may be used as an addition, added expression of uh, festival or season of the church uh, with color, symbols, words. They should symbolize more than state in words. This is actually, I had never thought of this either, but I think he's so right. The tendency is to want to say a bunch of stuff, but that's more distracting, yeah. right? Uh, and that if you, can, if you can show it in a picture, it doesn't demand so much of you as, as a viewer of it, or a, of the sanctuary as well. Um, so I thought that was an interesting thought. Uh, only uh, banners that are works of fine craftsmanship can be used. I have seen the extremes in my life, from things that look like a, one of these two put it together to, to higher quality works. Um, we have very fine craftsmanship. I agree. Making most I agree. I, I've, I've commented about their baptismal banners especially. Um, the exception, of course, you guys know this already, Good Friday, uh, you don't have anything hanging on the walls, right? You, you take it away. I, I assume that's what, maybe you don't. Yes, I'm looking for affirmation. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Um, a word must be said about flags. Uh, many Lutheran churches display flags in the chancel or nave, but this practice must be discouraged. Uh, the national flag is a symbol of the state whose values and purposes are different from and sometimes incompatible with those of the church. The Christian flag is a piece of redundant and distracting symbolism, since the focus of the church is on the altar and the cross on the chancel. Moreover, these flags serve no liturgical function, but were introduced into churches for political reasons, uh, mainly around World War I. Um, if congregations insist on having them, they should be displayed in the Narthex or Fellowship Hall. Um, this is something I have never met a, met a pastor in the LCMS who disagrees with this paragraph. <laughs> uh, and I have never met, I rarely met a pastor who has ever removed the flags from, from the church. Uh, it, in fact, when, they, when we left seminary, they told us, whatever you do, don't touch the flags. Um, so I love the idea of having them in the narthex, but, uh, and actually this one is really a Methodist flag, and I'd rather have one with the LCMS cross or a Luther seal or something than, than the Christ, Christian flag, so-called Christian flag. But, um, my, my impression also is that this, this issue matters far more to the veterans of World War II than anybody else. And that um, trying to fight them is not a battle worth doing, uh, but that in 20 years, no one's really gonna care too much. Uh, so that's kind of how I look at it. Um, don't spit in the eye of your veterans. So, but we could probably, if you wanted to, get a Luther seal instead of the Methodist flag without anyone questioning it too much. Um, I, 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 I want to go on, but I got to give you this story. So at, at Bethany, they had the the Christian flag in every sink, or every uh, every classroom, and the uh, the national flag as well. Every morning, you said the at the school you would say your your pledge of allegiance and then your pledge of the Christian flag, which isn't that bad really. Um, anyway, so we made this really intentional effort to like uh, get the Christian flag out of the the classrooms, uh, and we replaced it instead with saying the Apostles' Creed and the Lord's Prayer in the morning right after the Pledge of Allegiance. I mean, it was before, I don't remember. Uh, so then after we did this, and uh, one of the kids in my fifth grade class I was teaching, uh, I was explaining why we did it, she raised her hand and she goes, so Pastor, if you took it out of the classrooms because it's not appropriate, why is it still in the sanctuary? <laughs> and I, I dodged that question so hard, I was not gonna answer that question. Um, <laughs> and, but it, it demonstrates how touchy an issue it is once it gets to the sanctuary. It was far easier to remove them from the classrooms. Um, the Advent wreath uh, may be mounted on a stand hung from the ceiling horizontal. If the pyramids are blue, blue candles should be used. If violet, violet candles. With the use of the one-year lectionary, or when a congregation observes Gaudete, which is the third Sunday, a rose or pink candle is lit. Um, the use of the Christ candle this is not the one in the picture. This is the one in the middle of the Advent wreath. I've never heard this argument until I read this, so we can debate it if we want. But the, um, is to be discouraged. Uh, it says it should be discouraged because it's an importation of the idea of the Paschal candle. 
That is, it takes away, this is the candle we should light on Christmas, right? And now we're adding another one over here. Um, now, you could technically take this one out of the congregation and then use the other one as your Paschal candle for Christmas, but they, they're at odds with each other as candles. And that's the point that the paragraph's making. Um, also, recognizing, now I don't think we're ever going to get here, but he said, the Advent wreath belongs to the season of Advent, um, and so it should be gone by Christmas. <laughs> so um, I, I would, I, you would have to pull my arm to get me to tell you to take the Advent wreath out for Christmas Eve. I, I, I don't know. But I do think the idea of, of emphasizing this candle versus the other one is worth thinking about. I mean, it doesn't matter. But um, that's the argument. Almost done here. Uh, another season appointment is this Paschal candle from the Greek word for Pascha, which he says it means Easter, but the word means suffering in Hebrew. It, it's, it's the sacrificial candle of Christ. The Passover is connected to this. Symbolizes Christ's resurrection uh, over sin and death. Usually this candle goes back to the 4th and 5th century. So it's one of the older traditions that we have. Um, the Vigil of Easter marks the first lighting of the Paschal candle. Uh, crap, maybe we'll have to pick up here. It's going to be out of time. When it says first lighting, it doesn't mean first lighting of the year, the liturgical year. In many, well, most congregations before oil-based candles were introduced, you would buy a brand new Paschal candle every year with the year date on it, and the first time you would light it would be Easter, and you would burn it at the appropriate times throughout the year, and then you'd get a new one the next year. We have a permanent one, so that, that first word doesn't really fit. Um, but here now, so he says you would light it at Easter, and from Easter until Ascension Day, which is like a week before Pentecost, um, uh, would be the time to light it. On the other hand, uh, it may be placed next to the baptismal font. Congregations are encouraged to light the Paschal candle for the sacrament of baptism. Um, other appointments, uh, you can, the ecclesiastical supply catalogs are full of products to buy. Uh, the idea is that they should not conflict with our theology, serve a liturgical purpose, symbolism should be clear, avoid clutter, sensationalism, and sentimentalism. That's probably worth talking about, but we don't have any more time. And next time we'll pick up with decorations and sacred space. That might be bringing that up at that point. So, yeah? Keep thinking, keep studying, keep... Karen, thank you. We gotta go do choir.